So let's just take um, a minute as we're getting ready to, uh, to be in a more formal meditation, just to consider our intention tonight. And one of the things that I often reflect on, especially when I'm sitting with other people is that amazing phenomenon that when we sit together, we give support to each other and we get support from each other. And to really just have your antennae out for that, just to really notice the goodness of sitting in a, a community. You know, it's, um, there's a sutta that is very often um, cited and it's when Ananda, the Buddha's very lovable, very good, disingenuous attendant says to him, uh, venerable Lord, uh, it seems to me that having good friends is half the holy life. And the Buddha says to him, oh no, Ananda, don't say that Ananda, that is not right, Ananda. Having spiritual friends is the whole of the holy life. So it's this idea that we really do support each other and encourage each other and model for each other and uplift each other. And that's really something to cherish. So please make yourself comfortable in a, a way that enables you to be both um, relaxed and alert. And if you would prefer not to have your video on while we're sitting together, that's okay. It's always lovely when we're together in a group. Um, if it's okay to have your camera on, but for now, just just do whatever seems most supportive to you. And I'll ring the bell once to start and once to end. So just allow your attention to come into the body. In as kindly a way as possible. And just letting the attention drift through the body. just appreciating whatever strength, whatever stability, whatever functionality we have. The Buddha once said, whatever there is to be learned can be learned from this fathom long body. So the body can be our, our teacher and our companion. And as we sit here together this evening, just allow yourself to recognize your place Mary Oliver says the world offers itself to your imagination and it offers itself to our our presence our good deeds 
part of this great biosphere. So we take our place in it. And mindfulness is being aware of the present moment's experience, just as it is. The experience of the body, the experience of the mind, external and internal. So this evening, I would invite you to practice mindfulness with an open and receptive awareness. It's very easy in practice to fall into a subtle and sometimes not so subtle striving. So see if it's possible to just let yourself relax into an awareness. Just clearly perceiving whatever arises, whatever passes away. And if it's supportive for you, you can certainly use the breath as a way of stabilizing the attention. But let it be a support rather than a taskmaster. Just accepting and letting go with every breath. Trusting ourselves. And trusting awareness.
and for the last few minutes of this initial meditation, I would invite you to see if you can cultivate, bring about a sense of appreciation or gratitude. And really let your awareness be as much with that experience of appreciation or gratitude as with the object of appreciation or gratitude. Bring this mindful awareness to that experience of appreciation of gratitude. So take a minute or two just to move the body however it would feel good to stretch a little bit. And I'm Patrice Kelch, and I am um, zooming in not far from common ground in the Seward neighborhood on the ancestral and contemporary lands of the Dakota and Ojibwe. And is there anyone here who is coming to the Wednesday night program for the first time. Okay. So um, why don't you, if you are at all inclined, just unmute yourself and just say hello and let people know where, you, where you're located this evening. Well, I thought this evening, I would continue with Shelley's theme of loving kindness. And loving kindness or metta is the, uh, and sort of the, in its most minimal sense, it is the abandonment of ill will. In a more positive direction, it is this wholehearted, healthy concern for the welfare of all. And loving kindness, like the other 
Brahma Vihara qualities of compassion and appreciative joy and equanimity. Each one of those um, beautiful states of mind has what's called uh, a near enemy and a far enemy. And the far enemy of the attitude or the mind state of loving kindness, of course, is hatred. That's the opposite. And the near enemy is the state of mind that is very close to uh, loving kindness, but it's disguised. So that's why we call it the, the near enemy because it's, it's sometimes very hard to recognize. And for loving kindness, the near enemy is um, attachment to outcome. It's having an agenda. So you might be wishing someone well, but really what you're wishing is that they behave in a very particular sort of way. What you, you want something out of it. You have an attachment to uh, a very particular kind of, um, of outcome. And with the other qualities, for example, for um, compassion, the opposite of compassion would be cruelty. And the near enemy of compassion is pity. So the near enemy always has this sort of separating characteristic the near enemy is always removed from, um, from the object of one's compassion or one's loving kindness. It's this sort of, of separation. And sometimes that can be, be really subtle, but I'd like you just to keep that in mind as we talk about um, loving kindness tonight, because what we're going to do is uh, talk about love particularly as um, the late great magnificent bell hooks talked about love. <clears throat> so some of you who've heard me talk about this before um, have heard me say that I'm always struck that what is so essential about us as human beings is that we are a caring species. And that I think is the most important, important thing about us. And that each of us is here only because some, some other being or set of beings cared enough about us to keep us alive. So that that we are born into care and we grow up in care. Sometimes it's not, it's not perfect care, but as a species, we are a caring species. And, and sometimes the image that we are a competitive species is given a lot of play, but essentially the more important the more fundamental aspect of us is that we are a caring species. And it seems to me that caring is the very foundation of love, that we care. Um, we care about something or someone, and that is the very foundation of love. So what I'd like to do tonight is to explore uh, a text from Bell Hooks that I have been thinking about a lot um, since her death last week. <clears throat> and she says, I believe wholeheartedly that the only way out of domination is love. And the only way into really being able to connect with others and to know how to be is to be participating in every aspect 
of your life as a sacrament of love. I'll read it over and then I'm going to go through it bit by bit with you. I believe wholeheartedly that the only way out of domination is love. And the only way into really being able to connect with others and to know how to be is to be participating in every aspect of your life as a sacrament of love. And I want to begin by talking about domination, by talking about my experience with my little rescue dog, Storm. And um, Storm came into my life, it will be two years in February, and she is, um, when I got her, she was a seven-year-old miniature Australian shepherd. Um, and she was originally from Texas, and she had been used for commercial breeding for about six years. And she was in foster care for about five months before I got her. And um, so her entire life was living in a cage and having puppies that were, um, were then sold. And when we got her, and, and one of the conditions of our adopting her was that we had to have another dog in the family um, that they said that that would be really important. And we were actually looking for another dog because we'd had two older dogs who had died the year before and our current dog who was the same age as Storm, our rescue. Um, was uh, very unhappy being an only dog and acted out a lot. Um, someone who is an animal communicator said, you know, he just really can't handle his emotions very well. A lot of grief about the, the death of the older dogs and um, just not knowing how to manage. So, so we brought Storm into, and that was the name that she was given, which was, a, it's a kind of ironic name because she is terrified of storms, but that was the name she, uh, she knew. And when we got her, um, she spent most of the first two months of her life down in our basement. And I would have to go looking for her. We have a a lot of stuff in our basement and she would find nooks and crannies and just hide. And I go downstairs and pick her up and carry her out to the backyard and um, stay with her outside. But she was mostly just terrified for the first two months. It was just really um, so challenging and um, she started, we would keep her in our upstairs as much as we could, and she'd often hide. Um, she was very quiet, very meek, um, incredibly well house trained. Um, and it was just, it was so, so gradual. And I just, as I was trying to, I put her on a leash and walk her around the yard, try to take her out of the yard. Um, and she was mostly just hyper, hyper vigilant and terrified of almost everything. And when she finally decided that I was her person, she would actually, when I got in the shower in the morning, she would get in the shower with me and just huddle in the corner and get soaking wet, which was you know, heartbreaking in, in a way that she, she felt that she just had to follow me everywhere. And um, you know, she is the product of you know, incredible domination. If she would see anyone lifting an arm, like to throw anything, people with Frisbees, 
she would just have a meltdown. She would be so frightened. And um, I would try taking her on walks. She'd actually be, be pretty interested in going for a walk. But when we got to the end of the block, it was as if there was an electric fence. And she would just hunker down and not want to, to go any further. And um, last September, this was still happening after we'd had her for six months. And I just thought, maybe this is going to be the way it is. You know, I had looked forward to having a dog that would really be a walker because our other dog, Benny, who is Shih Tzu with just a little bit of Samoyed is, um, well, someone said, he's not a pleaser. Um, and he's not really a walker. He is a saunterer and a smeller and a go at his own speed kind of guy. And um, I had really looked forward to having a dog for long walks. And I just thought, okay, maybe, maybe this is it. Maybe this is the, she will just never, never get over her, her fear of being uh, away from the house. Um, but, um, I worked with her and we took Benny with her and would often say, you know, Benny can just, let's go with Benny. Let's just go half a block more with Benny. Let's just try to do this. And um, what I really discovered was that I'm not a very patient, I mean, my, my family members will tell you that I am not a very patient person, but I just found that it was so easy to be patient with her because it was completely grounded in compassion. You know, that, that compassion, when we, we recognize the suffering of another, it just makes this, this possible. So we've been working now uh, for almost two years on taking walks and um, you know, Storm sort of had a, a breakthrough late last year and we started taking longer walks and this spring we would take um, we would we would take walks along the Mississippi River. And there are still times when she resists and she often wants to take the shortest way home. And um, and I thought, oh this is kind of, and I usually say, oh no, Storm, you know, you know our big loop. We're gonna do the big loop today. And um, but I realized how much this is sort of like in our practice, because sometimes something will be going on and she will just kind of shut down and hunker down. And, and I think, okay, today this is as, as far as we get to go. Um, when there's a little bit of resistance and I just kind of say, no, 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 we're still gonna go. But I thought this is so much like meditation practice in a way, I mean, thinking back to how in meditation practice, sometimes, you know, that we find our own resistance, things are not going well, and we sort of want to take the shortcut home. And, um, and on those times when there's just this resistance, you know, the skillful thing is to kind of make effort and continue. But there are other times in our practice where things are so chaotic or unsettled, um, or miserable, that the really skillful thing to do is just to really back off and take the shortest way home, to do metta, to do something else. I mean, I've found that this has been such a, um, a teaching for me about the idea of what is, what is skillfully working with resistance and what is compassionately recognizing when that resistance um, needs to be respected and I need another, another strategy. Um, so it's really been amazing to me to sort of undo the harm of, of domination um, with this dog who now, uh, it's really been only in this past six months that she's actually found her voice 
She never barked for the first year and a half. And now she lets us know if she wants to come in. And sometimes she's, she'll never be much of a barker, but she does use her, excuse me, use her voice sometimes. And, and just seeing her have the sense of agency that you know, she'll let us know when she wants treats. She, she expresses herself. I mean, seeing this personality, she realizes that she can get into the family bed you know, I mean, it's seeing this, and I really think that this is love that has really been the antidote to domination. And, you know, we can talk about how that might play out in our human realm and our political realm in, in so many ways, but it's so simple to see it with an animal, how love can really undo the harm of domination. And it also takes a really, really long time, it, much longer than I expected. I didn't think it would take almost two years for her to, um, to sort of really come into her own and have this happy personality. She will always be a really wary dog. She will always be vigilant. She'll always be watchful. But she's a really happy dog now with her own personality. And what I think is so also important about being a human, well, being an animal or a human being is to have a sense of one's own agency. You know, that is one of the best things that can happen to us when we feel that what we do can make a difference, that we can be who we are. So that's sort of this, this first part of the quote um, about the, um, the only way out of domination is love. And Bell Hooks goes on to say, the only way to connect with others, and I'm gonna stop here before the rest of it because uh, I read uh, a profile of Brene Brown a couple of weeks ago in the New Yorker. And her big subject right now is connection talks a lot about connection, our need to connect, our desire to connect. And she said in this interview that she had been listening to a talk by Jack Cornfield, where he had been talking about the near and far enemy. And she said, she realized that the far enemy of connection is disconnection, right? The opposite of connection. But the near enemy of connection is control. And I just thought that is so brilliant. That is so, I mean, as soon as she said it, of course. And um, control can, uh, can be, it's a, a subtle form of domination, but I can really see it interfering with my desire to connect with my partner, with my friends, that when that, that little subtle impulse to control what's going on, it's sort of like in, in Metta, where we have the, the attachment to a certain outcome, that control really undermines connection. So Bell Hook says, the only way to connect with others and to know how to be is to be participating in every aspect of your life as a sacrament of love. So how we participate, the only way to know how to be this is about presence. It's about being fully aware. But then there is this glorious, mysterious spiritual challenge is to be participating in every aspect of your life as a sacrament of love. And I've just been thinking, what could that mean? What would that be like to participate in every aspect of my life as a sacrament of love. Because sacraments are not only sacred enactments, 
sacraments are also transformational. So in, in Catholicism, the sacraments are baptism, confirmation, the Eucharist, confession, marriage, and anointing the sick. So these are all enactments that have a sort of transformative power or Saint Augustine talked about them as outward signs of uh, inward grace. But if we took this idea that our life, that our, our task in some ways is to participate with the way we are with ourselves, with being present and the way we are with each other as a sacrament of love, something that is inherently transformative. So it would be transformative for ourselves, but also transformative for whomever we engaged with. And that is just an, an amazing idea. And because I, uh, I sort of decided this is what I wanted to share with you tonight and talk about. So I was trying to imagine today as I went through my day, um, could this be uh, a sacrament of, of love? And so I was really mindful. I went to, as I do every Wednesday, go to Qigong, um, Common Grounds uh, Qigong Classic, really mindful about this is a transformative practice, transformative for me, and we do it in a group, it's transformative. Um, I was probably not so successful um, when I was at Target about really participating. I wasn't, I just got distracted as we all do. Um, but I was trying to, how could I be transformative um, and have meta for the other, other shoppers and, uh, and really regard this as an opportunity to uh, transform myself. And then this afternoon, I had a monthly Zoom with um, a friend who now lives in DC. So once a month, we try to have a, a Zoom conversation just to stay really present in each other's lives. And I was able to like feel the, um, the transformation of our very long friendship and just feel the sort of wonderful um, impact of, of that. Um, so what if we, if we assumed that our love and, and Saida Upandita always talked about metta karuna, that he always thought love was infused with compassion. So what if we were always to think about our, our love compassion would be constantly transforming us and transforming everyone else we encountered. And this is really relational dharma. I mean, it's that idea that everything, it matters, that everything we do matters. And you, know, you might say, well, of course, that's the teaching of karma. But this seemed to me to be more alive in a way that there's this possibility of ending domination, which would be a tremendous transformation and really being present and really connecting with others if we regarded what we were doing as somehow participating in a sacrament of, of love. And I think this is possible. I think this is possible at least some of the time. And I'm really interested in pursuing this as, as a spiritual practice and as a practice that is really transformative in, in the world. And when I do my political work to really think about the ending of domination as, um, as really love is what's going to, to end that, that domination, to end those, um, those forces. And it would have to be a very courageous love and a love that's filled with agency 
in which we really do take, take our seat, take our stand. But it just seems to me to be really fraught with um, possibilities. So um, that's what I have to offer this evening. And I would love to hear your um, thoughts about it, your responses, um, any ideas you might have. So just unmute yourself and jump in. Text back and forth with Bonnie Duran, whom some of you may know, who's a Dharma teacher about, um, she was talking about her dog, Maisie, and, and how um, animals can really be our, our teachers in a way. When we really pay attention to them and their sensitivity and, um, and what they bring out in us um, and how, um, how forgiving they often are. I mean, I've had, um, I had another rescue dog several years ago who was so, um, I, he was so badly beat. His, his teeth were gone on one side because he'd been kicked in the mouth and his tongue fell. I mean, he was just, he was just this little, little race. And um, I couldn't get over how willing he was to give human beings another chance. You know, it just, I thought, wow, this is just amazing how grateful he was. He was just, and he was just this elderly, frail dog um, who didn't live very long. He died of a spleen tumor a couple of months after we had him. But, um, but I just couldn't get over how willing he was to give human beings another chance after he had been so, so badly treated by humans. And, um, you know, that was just kind of, kind of amazing. And there's also, um, there is a wonderful TED talk that someone recently brought to my attention. And I can't remember the psychologist's name, but it is about the um, neurological power of holding a person's hand. And I have thought sometimes, you know, in a procedure, sometimes when a nurse has offered to hold my hand and I felt sort of silly about it, but it made a huge difference. And, um, you know, that those, those small acts of love that we can just giving a person's hand a, a squeeze sometimes is, uh, you know, people feel so much less alone. And that really is the love that we can give, the love, the care, the care that we care that you, know, you are not alone. Practice. Joan Halifax has, has written about this a lot, um, the Roshi Joan. And um, you know, it's about letting go of expectations, letting go of bringing skill, but realizing that you're not in control. You know, and, and, um, so we have agency, but the, our agency is really in our skillfulness and in our ability to work with our own heart and mind in those situations. And, um, and that we don't control the outcome. And that's, um, so I'm, I'm happy for you that you're going to do that work. Um, I often think that, that the happiest nurses I meet are nurses who work in hospice, that they, um, they love their work. And um, I think it's partly because they often get to know their patients and, um, and they bring this sort of um, sacramental attitude toward that work that it is. It is a sacrament of love to take care of the dying. So I, I am so happy for you that you are, are going to do the, the doula training. Well, we can end with our beautiful practice, the, um, our practice of imaginative generosity. And just take in that, that this is the, we're now at that point of the year where we are beginning to have a little more light. We're just at this, you know, what just crossed over the threshold into, into more light. And we can bring this light into, into our lives. Um, and 
bell hooks, uh, you know, this her idea that if we we bring this um, capacity into everything, to in every aspect of our lives, to participate as if it's a sacrament of love. I mean, that really is sharing the merit in in the most um, beautiful, beautiful kind of way. So if there's any goodness to our practice, any merit, any blessing, any benefit, we would gladly, happily, joyfully share it with others. In fact, if we could, we would give it all away. We would give it to our parents, our teachers, our families, our friends. We would share our blessings with those we like and those we don't like so much. We would share our blessings with all the people we know and the millions upon millions of people we have yet to know. And in addition to sharing the merit with the two-leggeds, we would share it with the four-leggeds, the many-leggeds, the winged, the scaly, the slimy, the finny, with all creatures everywhere. May all beings find a path to peace. May all beings 